My name is Jackson, and I have the privilege and honor to deliver the message to you today. Um, it's always humbling to be here to deliver God's word, uh, because oftentimes I'm just trying to get my own spiritual life together. But we started this series a few weeks back, Devoted. Where do we go from here? And this is a question that I think uh, for many of us, uh, we are wrestling with even now, especially in this pandemic times, right? Whether it's as individuals or family, as a church or business or career, uh, right? Just when we thought things were going back to normal, um, you know, we could have in-person services, go traveling, different sports things, and all of a sudden, the Delta variant hit, and now here we are, right? Vaccine mandates, uh, additional restrictions, and, and so on and so forth. But you know what? That's, that's how things are today. Uh, the awesome thing is that the Book of Acts has some great examples to inspire us through these times. If you think about it, the apostles and the few disciples that had stayed together after Jesus' death had just seen their leader, whom they believed was the Son of God, crucified. And, and, and that must have been a challenge, because you know, for a lot of them, they gave up everything to follow him. And now what? And even after seeing the resurrected Jesus, some of them went back to fishing, right? Not just recreationally, but as a career, because they wanted to figure out, okay, we've got to kind of get our lives back uh, together. You know, a passage that uh, is very familiar to a lot of us uh, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. It says in Matthew 28, verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Okay, these are the 11 that Jesus had handpicked, right, to take over his ministry, his mission, to carry on what he started. And out of the 11, it says, some doubted. It wasn't even one or two of them. Uh, it doesn't say a couple of them. It says, some. Not a very reassuring beginning, right? What did they doubt? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't believe that they were doubting that Jesus is the Son of God or the resurrection or that he's the prophesied Messiah. But I think they were asking the same questions or the same question that we face today. Where do we go from here? So far, we looked at be worshipful, be relational. Uh, we had a little uh, sermon by Dave Pikert also uh, in the mix, which was pretty awesome uh, as he shared his uh, life and the things that you know, they were going through. And what an inspiration. Last week, we had Nick's lesson, which was titled Be Missional. Um, so thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Nick, for your lesson. Today, the title of my lesson is Be Inspirational. And one of the things that I remember from Nick's lesson is what he said. It's not that the church has a mission, but that God's mission has a church. And certainly the way that the church lived their lives in the first century serves as an inspiration for us today. Nick ended in Acts chapter 8, a time right after one of their own leaders, Stephen, was stoned to death, and a great persecution broke out against the church that ended up scattering a lot of the disciples from their homes and disrupted their lives. We can relate to disruptions, right? You know, though we may not be scattered, uh, certainly, probably, we're more stuck at home. Um, you know, yet in the midst of another crisis, the disciples continue to be strong in their faith and share their faith wherever they went, and they made a difference. 
I'm going to pick up where Nick left off in Acts chapter 8. Uh, for those of you guys who remember the lesson that I did about a month ago on two obscure characters in the New Testament, Matthias and Joseph called Barsabbas, right? Well, today, we're going to do the opposite. Uh, we're going to take a look at a character who arguably, outside of Jesus, is probably one of the most influential and inspirational figures in the New Testament, and that's the Apostle Paul. So let's jump right in. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1, it says, And Saul approved of their killing him, referring to Stephen. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. The end of Acts 7 is the very first time that Saul is introduced in the New Testament. He would later be known as Paul. And I thought um, we'd take a dive into Paul uh, because you know, we actually just finished a session in AIM Pacific's New Testament survey on Paul. Uh, so I thought it'd be kind of fitting. But he started out as a persecutor of the Christians. And this one event propelled him into a leadership position amongst his peers as he led the way in trying to stop this heretical movement of Jesus' followers. Yet somewhere down the road, he would become whom we know as the Apostle Paul, who pens 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. And on top of that, he also was a direct influence in three other books of the New Testament, Luke, Acts, and Hebrews. So, Let's look at the passage, but it's pretty inspirational because when you look at somebody like Paul, going from persecutor to being an apostle of Jesus, uh, that's, that's an incredible inspiration for us. If you ever come across somebody who you go, ah, they're not open, they're not gonna make it, Paul is a great inspiration for us. But we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians 15 verses 7 through 10. And this is sort of the theme scripture for our lesson this, today. It says in verse 7, Then he, referring to Jesus, appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Today's lesson is built around this passage. I believe that there are two things that Paul had to wrestle with in his journey to become the man that God meant for him to be. Humility and grace. And wrestling with those two things is what helped Paul to be inspired himself and in turn inspire us. You know, I firmly believe this. To become an inspiration to others, you must first be inspired yourself. So my first point, wrestling with humility. Part of wrestling with humility is to wrestle with the truth. Whether it's the truth about what we believe in or the truth about ourselves or those around us. You know, when I first came to church back in 1992 uh, and started studying the Bible, I was not very religious or spiritual. I didn't really have much of a religious upbringing. Um, you know, we had some. And, you know, but eventually my family saw enough hypocrisy that they felt like, eh, you know, going to church and the Christian thing just, eh, wasn't the way to go. So I became more of a self-proclaimed agnostic, right? None of my friends growing up talked about religion or God. 
a lot of them claim to be more atheist. Uh, for me, I just couldn't quite go that far to say that there is no God. Uh, that was kind of hard because when I looked at creation or life, I thought, for life to even be possible, for me to be able to be here and see and, and speak and smell and hear and think and feel, it's just an incredible miracle that no amount of evolution could explain it. But I thought on the flip side, I was like, well, I can't see God, so how could I know for sure? So agnostic it was. Uh, obviously, God has opened my eyes since then. Hard to actually believe that I'm here preaching a sermon. Um, and, and in truth, uh, my background I'm a, is engineering, and currently I work in construction uh, for a mechanical contractor. But you know, that was very different for Paul. He grew up as a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. Acts 23, verse 6, it says, then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and other Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. You know, Pharisees formed one of the major sects of Judaism in his day. The biggest sect, actually, and the most popular. Uh, not only that, but he was advancing in their ranks as a Pharisee. Galatians 1, verse 13 and 14, it says, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. Let's look at another passage, Acts 22, starting verse 1. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, referring to Jerusalem. I studied under Gamaliel and was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their deaths, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison as the high priest and all the council can themselves testify. I even obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Okay, so just a little background. Aramaic was a Semitic language closely related to Hebrew. It originally originated with the Arameans around the 11th century BC. By around the 8th century BC, it became accepted by the Assyrians as a second language. And as the Assyrian Empire rose in power and conquered the area and scattered those that they conquered throughout their empire, the northern kingdom of Israel being one of them, Aramaic became the lingua franca, or the common language that was used between the peoples of various ethnicities and become the language used for commerce. Similar to how it was in Hawaii, right, when different ethnic peoples came here to work. The Chinese, Filipinos, Koreans, Japanese, they, they all had to learn uh, English in order to communicate with each other. So Aramaic eventually was also the language that was adopted by the Babylonians when they conquered the Assyrians. The Babylonians also conquered the southern kingdom of Judah. And as early as the 6th century BC, Aramaic had slowly replaced Hebrew as a main language for the Jews. Parts of Daniel and Ezra were written in Aramaic. Eventually, Hebrew was what they used in worship, but Aramaic was a spoken language at home and everywhere else. Aramaic eventually was replaced by Greek as the lingua franca, when Alexander the Great expanded his empire, his vision 
was not just to conquer the land and the peoples, but to assimilate them into the Greek culture, Hellenization. So the Jews who had been scattered throughout the Greek empire began to learn and speak Greek. However, some of them who had previously returned to Judea to rebuild the second temple during the Middle Persian Empire, resisted Hellenization, and though they learned Greek, they stuck with Aramaic. It wasn't just a language difference, but a cultural one. Hebraic Jews, who mostly live in Jerusalem and Judea, resisted Hellenization and held on to Aramaic as their language. So Paul, who is at this moment in Jerusalem, starts to address these Hebraic Jews in Aramaic. And he made a point to basically say, hey, you know what? I am one of you, a Hebraic Jew. He was actually trained by the most respected rabbi of his day, Gamaliel. To have been chosen as a disciple, he would have to have known the Hebrew Bible backwards and forwards. The Jews refer to their Bible as the Tanakh. Uh, it's an acronym, T-N-K. T for the Torah, or the first five books of the Old Testament, uh, also referred to as the law. N for Nevi'im, uh, or the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, K for Ketuvim, which were writings which included the wisdom literature like Psalms and Proverbs, as well as other historical writings like Chronicles or Kings or Ruth. Um, and, and so he would have known the Hebrew Bible backwards and forwards. He could have recited the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament by memory, and maybe some other books also. He knew all the stories of the Old Testament as well as the prophecies about the Messiah. Yet, he believed that Jesus was not the Messiah, the Son of God, and that Jesus was a heretic, who by claiming that he's the Son of God was you know, being blasphemous. Why? Because Jesus was crucified. And as he wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, that that was a stumbling block for most Jews, and himself included. Deuteronomy 21, verse 22 and 23, it says that if someone guilty of a capital offense is put to death and their body is exposed on a pole, you must not leave the body hanging on the pole overnight. Be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a pole is under God's curse. So Deuteronomy is one of the books of the Torah. And according to the Torah, anyone who was crucified is considered to be cursed by God. So a crucified Messiah was an oxymoron for the Jews, a contradiction in terms. It wasn't Jesus' background or education or anything else, right? Um, that Paul would have objected to, or his teachings. It was just that, a crucified Messiah. He believed it so strongly that he became zealous and pursued disciples to their deaths and even led an expedition to arrest disciples who had run away from Judea into the surrounding areas. One of these cities was Damascus. Acts chapter 9 starting in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. 
The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could, not, he could see nothing. So they led him by his hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. That's the story of Paul being converted. But, you know, for those of you guys who are Matrix fans out there, I don't know if there's many of you out there, but it's kind of like the red pill and the blue pill, right? Uh, and, and that was what Paul was presented with. Taking the red pill would allow you to see the truth, but life would not be easy. Taking the blue pill meant that you could continue to live in the bliss and comfort of the fabricated reality that you are already familiar with. And that was a choice that Paul was confronted with on the road to Damascus. It meant that all that he had believed and all that he had acted on because of his belief, even taking of innocent lives was wrong. And he would have to admit that he was wrong, that he killed not a blasphemous heretic, but an innocent man who loved God sincerely and stood, stood firm in his faith. Wrestling with the truth and with humility. You know, it's hard to admit when you're wrong. Uh, I think of all the times my wife uh, tells me, so, are you going to apologize to the kids? Uh, and and my, my usual response is like, ah, no, look at how they acted. But then eventually, you know, I, I would swallow my pride and apologize because in truth, I was wrong and I sinned. And, you know, I, re I remember as a young Christian, I reached out to this guy who turned out to be a minister for a large campus ministry group at UPenn. Uh, that's my engineering uh, education. You know, I, I shared with him how God had moved my life and helped me to become a Christian and how I was recently baptized. You know, long story short, uh, we end up having a discussion um, and, you know, he showed me his pamphlet, uh, you know, that his ministry had put together and, you know, we talked about how to be saved. And there were some great things in that pamphlet about faith, repentance, and about how Jesus is the only one who could bridge the gap between us and God, right? The problem I had was with that last part about praying Jesus into your heart. And this may not be a popular thing to say right here, uh, but you know what? What I see in the Bible is that baptism is absolutely necessary for your salvation. It's not the only thing, but it is definitely a part of how to get saved. So we had a discussion. So I asked him, you know, can you show me a passage in the Bible that backs up what you are teaching? He brought up Revelations 3.20. Uh, and Revelations 3.20 says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. You know, I, I have nothing against praying or inviting Jesus into my heart. Uh, that'd probably be a good thing. <clears throat> but in context, um, this was written to the church in Laodicea, to those who were already Christians, but who needed to repent and not be lukewarm. So I, I pointed that out, right? I, I said, hey, you know, let's look at the context of this, you know, and how um, this was not meant as a passage about how to be saved, but about repentance for those who are already saved. You know, he admitted, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a weak passage to back up what he is teaching. You know, I told him, it's not weak, it's wrong. 
So I asked him, hey, you know, can you show me anywhere else in the Bible where God said that this is how you become saved? Or an example of somebody in the Bible that becomes a Christian by praying Jesus into your heart. So we actually met again a week later because I, I was like, you know, take, take your time, go study it out, and then come back and we can talk. Um, well, we met again and he couldn't really show me any passage that really backed up what he taught. He shared some other passages that, you know, were, were great passages, but I said, well, what does that have to do with praying Jesus into your heart? I would like to share some good news here that he was humble and was open to studying the Bible to see the truth. But I cannot. Uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't question his sincerity or his devotion to God. It's just that it's very hard to take that red pill. We, we ended amicably. Uh, but I told them, you know what, I, I'm just a student here, uh, but you lead many, and what you're teaching them is not biblical. You need to make sure, because as a leader, you are responsible. This is one of the reasons why I admire Paul. He wrestled with the truth and was able to humble himself enough to accept the truth and admit that he was wrong. Even when it meant that he had innocent blood on his hands. And you know the awesome thing about him is that his humility continued to grow in his character. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse nine, it says, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Look at what Paul writes about himself, right? I am the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle. It wasn't, look at all that I have done for the church. Look at all the churches that I have planted. Look at how much I sacrificed. That wasn't his heart. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, it says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I will show mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. 1 Corinthians was written sometime around 53 AD. 1 Timothy was written around 63 AD. 10 years later, he's no longer talking about being the least of the apostles. He's talking about being the worst of sinners. Humility. How is your humility? Is it hard to admit that you are wrong? Is it hard to admit sin. You know, in the landscape of doctrine and theology, of denominations and divisions that we have today in Christianity, how well do you know the Bible? Are you willing to wrestle with the truth and its implications? Are you willing to wrestle with humility? You know, and I want to encourage you, if what I said disturbed you or offended you, or if it just doesn't sit well with what you have been taught, reach out and study the Bible with us. Find out what the Bible says. Not what this church or that church or this leader or that leader, but find out what does the Word of God say. Amen? My second point, wrestling with grace. Wrestling with humility and truth leads us to wrestle, to wrestling with grace. As I mentioned, Paul had to accept what he had done. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. 
That's an awesome passage. I love that. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know, sometimes when we look at the truth, whether it's what we believe or what we have done or who we are, we can feel guilty. And Paul had to face that in his life. You know, his first involvement with Christians was presiding over Stephen's death. So here's something that's interesting. All right, Acts chapter 6, Stephen was chosen from among the brothers in the church to serve. That same chapter, we read about how Stephen uh, is seized and brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. And then chapter 7, which is actually the longest chapter in the book of Acts, uh, is his speech to the Sanhedrin. That entire chapter is devoted to Stephen. Verses 1 to 53 is his speech before the Sanhedrin. Verses 40, uh, 54 to 60 record Stephen's stoning. Two chapters in Acts devoted to Stephen. Why? You know, the stoning of Stephen led to persecution breaking out against the disciples and scattering, scattering them throughout Judea and Samaria. Eventually, that would lead to the church being established in Antioch which is the main city in the Roman province of Syria. Some scholars believe that Luke uh, was from Syria and was converted there. But Antioch became the home base of Paul from where he would launch his missionary journeys. So it is tied into the whole theme of the book of Acts. But you know, to me, I think there's actually something more there. Acts is written by Luke. Luke wasn't even a Christian at the time Stephen was martyred. However, Luke was one of Paul's traveling companions. And I believe that Stephen's death weighed heavily on Paul's heart. And he must have recounted what happened to Luke many times during the long days uh, or those quiet nights when they talked while traveling from one city to another. 1 Timothy 1 shows us a little bit more about Paul. Verse 13, it says, Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I will show mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. I think because it was on Paul's heart, I believe Luke dedicated the longest chapter in Acts to Stephen. And the whole point in all this is that even through the worst things that we have done in our lives, God extends grace to us through the cross. And what does that do for us? What does that do in us? For Paul, he said it was not without effect. He accepted God's grace, and that inspired him. He was grateful, and that gratitude moved him to live an inspired life. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22. It says, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked 
Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin I do not inwardly burn? What moved him to live that kind of life? God's love that was shown him through his grace. Was it worth it? You know, I think when he looks at each one of us here, I think he would say, yes, it was worth it. Just like it was when Jesus went on the cross. In Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, it says, for the joy set before him. What is that joy? It's, it's us. It's you and me. And Paul imitated Christ in that way. He was inspired by God's grace and by what God had done for him. And in turn, his life and his life work is an inspiration for us today. Here's a slide that kind of talks about chronology of Paul's life. Um, some of these dates are actually speculative, but kind of gives you a, a good reference, right? Born in Tarsus, studies in Jerusalem under Gamaliel. Um, he persecutes the way. And around 33 AD or so, there's a road to Damascus where he gets converted. Uh, then his trip to Arabia, um, you know, in 33 to 35 AD, and then back to ministering in Damascus. Um, first visit to Jerusalem uh, in around 35 AD, uh, where he first meets Barnabas. 35 to 44 AD, He's back in Tarsus in Cilicia. And you know, it's kind of interesting because Tarsus is his home, right? Um, N.T. Wright writes a, a great book on Paul and calls this sort of his obscure years, but formative years um, for him. I mean, imagine his conversations with his family, right? Descendants of Pharisees. So now that he's converted, that must have been something. I, I wish we had more time to go through this, but um, then we kind of go through the rest of you know, uh, his life, brought to Antioch by Barnabas, uh, and he went to visit Jerusalem again, his first missionary journey, the council in Jerusalem, and then the second and third missionary journeys uh, as well. And you know, him being arrested in Jerusalem, imprisoned in Caesarea, and then traveling to Rome and being house arrest there. Beyond that, he actually was released from Rome in around 63 AD. Uh, according to tradition, Paul visits Spain in 65 AD and is executed in Rome under Nero by beheading. <clears throat> so, um, just to wrap things up today, 1 Corinthians 11, Verse 1, it says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And some practical questions for us today. What inspires you today? What can you do to get more inspiration in your life? In what ways can you be more humble? How can you be more in touch with God's grace? And what has God produced in your life? You know, where do we go from here? Get inspired and be an inspiration for those around you. Amen? Thank you. Before you go, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. You can also follow us on social media and find the link to our connection card down in the description below. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Bye!